Hey fellow YouTube viewers, I'm going to do a short and sweet video on how to configure a small office or branch router for your home use. With that said, let's get started. I've got a console session open here to my Cisco 891F, um, and we'll get into the basic configuration here. Here's enable mode and configure T. Um, these timeout errors, just ignore them. This is the router trying to automatically download or TFTP a config. Not something to concern yourself with. Let's set the V2I line so we make the login here on the console a little bit easier. Line V2I 015. Logging synchronous. We're also going to set this up for um, SSH, so we'll type, so we'll specify a local login as well. Uh, I can't do that yet until I specify the username and password. Just kidding. Let's go back. Give the router a host name. My home router. Simple enough. It immediately changes the router host name. Let's do our super secret enable password. Super secret. And specify the SSH username and password. Uh, we don't want to do password because that will do it in clear text. We want to do username admin secret. Ah, quit doing that. Zero. And then the clear text password. Let's just do SSH password. Okay. Now we can go back to the V2I lines and do login local. Okay. Perfect. Now, if you want to do any troubleshooting from command line, uh, we need to tell this device where to go to get its DNS names. We'll specify that with the IP name server command. I just like to use Google, it's simple. And before we generate SSH keys, we need to specify a domain name. MyDomain.com. With that being said, let's generate some crypto keys. RSA modulus 2048 general keys. And this will allow SSH login for remote administration. And as you can see, took the host name and your domain and created a certificate for that. SSH, uh, SSH version 1.99 has some vulnerabilities, so we want to specify SIP SSH version 2. Let's set our time zone. Clock time zone MST. We are negative 7. And we should see here system clock has been updated from UTC to February 12, 2019. And it is 2.01 in the afternoon. Okay. What's next on my notes here? Logging. Okay. Logging. Buggered. Ah. Buffered. Informational. We don't want to fill up the logs with a bunch of garbage. Okay. The default size is 81.92. And if you want to double that size, 81.92, you would do 16.384. Basically, that's just 81.92 times 2. Okay, that's a really good log size. You don't want to get any bigger than that. And local VLANs, okay? We have an eight port switch built in to this Cisco 891F, so we'll, we're gonna use this as our switch as well. Otherwise, you would do these commands on the downstream switch. VLAN 10, and you can choose whatever VLAN number you want. It just is locally significant to you, and you have to associate that with your DHCP pool and switch virtual interface. Let's name it users and that's it for the VLAN configuration but we do have to have a switch virtual interface to be able to get DHP addresses and route traffic and associate that to the VLAN so we type in interface VLAN 10 and no shut done a no shut on that but since we don't have any interfaces associated to that VLAN yet it is going to be shut down so we'd either have to manually tag um, an interface as access VLAN 10 or do a trunk interface to bring that up. Okay, check my notes here, configure SVI, DHP pools. Okay, since we now have, oh, I skipped a step. Sorry, I got interrupted, now I'm out of my groove. IP address, and we're going to set a locally significant uh, IP address for your network. It can be whatever you choose. Um, I like to choose 192 address space. 
128.1. Oops. And give myself a class C mask so I have uh, 250 addresses to use in my DHP pool. Did I squeeze me? Oh, okay. I have this connected to a lab router and the outside interface is going to be in the 128s. So that's what's happening. Um, I got interrupted, so I gotta step back in here. Super secret, thank you. Go back into config terminal, interface VLAN 10. And because I have this connected to a lab, um, I need to be careful about what IP address I set. But since this is locally significant and it's going to be just a private subnet that I choose, I'm going to choose 192.168. Actually, let's do something different. Let's do 10 dot. 10 dot, 10 dot, 1 dot 0. Okay. So this is a RFC 1918 address space and a class C subnet mask. Make sure we do a, <laughs> excuse me, no shut. Don't accidentally type the naughty word with an I. I've done that before. It's quite hilarious. Anyways, um, now we're going to go back and configure a DHCP pool to associate to VLAN 10. So IP DHCP pool, home. And this is uh, just a name that you're giving it. It doesn't have to be home. It can be whatever you want. Specify the network to use for this DHCP pool. Dot zero being the network address. And we specify the default router of 10.10.10.1. Since that is the interface VLAN 10, IP address that acts as the default gateway for all users. DNS servers. Now because you specified it earlier um, as an IP name server that is only for the router itself when you do tests from a command line or when the router tries to look something up through an automated process. Specifying the DNS server here is for your end users and that's um, what they will receive in their lease. Set the lease, let's just say one day. There's also an option here for the DHP database to remember. So what this, do, what this will do is record um, the MAC addresses and, and IP addresses associated with that through the DHP lease, and it'll set that in the database. So when that device comes back on the network, it will retain its old IP address. Unless it gets full and there's a conflict, then you'll manually have to clear that out. Okay, let's step back out of DHCP configuration. All right, now I have a switch connected to get, uh, interface GI0, so I'm going to set that switch, or excuse me, that interface to switch port mode trunk. Okay, so that any VLANs downstream on the switch will uh, be trunked back up through this interface to the router. Let's take a look at the running config there. Okay, simple enough. Switch port mode trunk, there's no IP address assigned. We can also name these interfaces. So let's do description, downstream switch, just like that spell. What we can also do is on interface GI1, let's say I have a, an Xbox. Uh, connect it here, Xbox, interface GI2, let's say we have a printer. Okay, but both of these interfaces um, are not going to be trunks. They're going to be access ports. Now, the default configuration for these interfaces, and I'm, I'm running the do command from interface configuration mode. Otherwise, I would have to back out. Um, so run interface GI1. Okay, we have the description and no IP address, but it is associated to VLAN 1. That is the default VLAN that is, that is for uh, access ports. So we have to specify switch port access 10. And we'll also do that on port 2 as well. well let's see what's next. Ah, the WAN interface. I'm going to back all the way out here. So run interface GI8. Okay. <clears throat> now, this interface was automatically configured to grab an IP address via DHCP. If you wanted to statically specify the address, you would do IP address dot zero. Okay. Oh, nope, that's the SBI. Don't do that. 
That's bad. Um, you would specify the static IP address that would allow you to communicate with the upstream router or your internet service provider. And since I know the lab IP um, that was given to this device, I can statically set that. Okay. But since it's being, being received via DHCP, I don't have to, which makes it really convenient. Step away for a second, but I am back. Let's see what's next. We are going to configure NAT, Network Address Translation. <clears throat> Excuse me. Easiest way to do this uh, is with a route map. We name our route map NAT. And we do a permit of a sequence number, and just whatever sequence number you, to, you choose is fine. Tens is, tens the easiest for me to always remember. But we're going to match this route map NAT statement on Gigabit Ethernet. And we'll step back out of route map configuration mode and specify our NAT translation. So IP NAT inside source route map NAT oh, excuse me, interface GI8 overload. Overload is necessary because we don't have a pool of addresses, of public IP addresses to NAT against. And so this statement turns it from NAT into PAT, port address translation. If you're not familiar with uh, NAT versus PAT, be sure to go Google that and get a firm understanding of why that's necessary. What's next? Uh, we need some default routes. Uh, we have NAT enabled, and so we have to be able to tell users how to get to the internet. Since we're not dynamically routing or peering with our internet service provider, um, we're just going to do a quad zero default route out to the internet. Oop, pardon me. What's going on here? And my router. And my laptop freaking out. So let's go IP route 0 .0 .0 .0 0.0.0.0.0.0. Two ways you can do this. You can do DHCP. Since our WAN interface is receiving a DHCP address, um, what this will do is the DHCP component will query the WAN interface and automatically set the next hop gateway address uh, in your static route. That is a Really nice feature in case your IP address ever changes or you change modems, uh, you will not have to come in and change your static default route. The other way to do it is if you know the upstream uh, gateway address, 192.168.128.254, which is the one in my lab. Sorry, I'm kicking stuff. Uh, that would be my next hop, uh, depending upon what I receive for a DHP address on the WAN interface. You can also name these routes. You can track them uh, if you're doing IPSLA um, or working on other features on tracking your default route. But that's a whole other discussion. So let's just leave this as DHCP. Simple. Okay. Oh, very critical. One thing I forgot here. On the WAN interface, we have to tell it, tell NAT that this is the outside interface. Okay. We also have to specify the inside interface, IP NAT inside. Okay. What this does is it sets up the NAT translation relationship to tell it, take the, the interface VLAN 10 IP address of 10 dot whatever and NAT it against the WAN interface or GI8 and overload it. So then it assigns a unique port anywhere from uh, in the, not in the reserved range, but in the dynamic range of ports. Um, for example, one flow uh, to the internet from a user could be on port 65535, uh, and that would be relevant to that specific flow. And it will choose additional ports um, for more flows from the user or traffic. So let's take a look at the running config here and do a summary. <clears throat> so quickly here we see a host name, logging buffered, and we doubled the default size. We set our clock time zone. We have a DHCP pool with a network statement, a default router, and DNS servers. And since we're on a small network here, we're telling the DHCP database to set up and remember the bindings. We specified a IP domain name to set up our SSH keys, IP name servers to look up domains from the CLI. We have our SSH username and password. And if you specify password um, zero here instead of secret, that password is turned into a level seven, and level sevens are uh, can be decrypted. 
Um, however, secret and if you specify level zero plain text, it will turn it into MD5. And this is a hash and it is not reversible. Um, moving on, IPSSH version two, some interface configuration here, switch port mode trunk for the downstream switch. We labeled uh, our access interfaces and bound them to access VLAN 10. Nothing else is active, so there's no need to configure anything else. Okay, and as we see, we have our IP address, which is our default gateway for our users on the VLAN 10 SVI, IP NAT inside, which is necessary for NAT to work correctly. Our NAT translation here, IP NAT inside source route map, which is referencing match interface eight. And then we specify the outside interface gigabit 8 and tell it to do a PAT overload. We have two default routes in here, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, which is not necessary, but just for reference, um, it gives you an idea of how to specify the next hop gateway or let, D let the DHCP uh, daemon figure that out for you. Our route map statement, there's some default commands that are in here. I just ignore those. As you can see here, we've set logging to synchronous, keeps all your commands on the same line instead of splitting them when there's log information. Log into local for SSH to work properly. Transport input is SSH, so only accepting SSH as the inbound protocol for management to the V2I lines, but we set output to Telnet and SSH. What that does is it gives us the ability to SSH and Telnet out from this router to websites for testing purposes. So this just gives you a basic overview of how to configure a small branch uh, home office Cisco router um, for your use. Hopefully this was helpful, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Thanks.